Praise the Lord. This is the day that the Lord has made and we're rejoicing and we're glad in it. This is Resurrection Sunday and I'm excited about it. Thank you for joining us wherever you are in the world. I'm excited and grateful for you joining us, but I'm excited that this is the day we're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is his resurrection that gives him a clear distinction from any other person in the world and we're celebrating that today. I'm going to be ministering about misconceptions and lies. As a matter of fact, so many people are defeated because they've bought in and believed and embraced misconceptions and lies from the enemy. So we're going to be asking questions and looking at a number of passages that speaks to those questions. And I believe we got some clear answers from the Word of God, and I believe it will give you clarity and direction not only for your own issues, but even for the issues of others that you, you know who need answers to these misconceptions and lies. Thank you for joining us, and we pray God's richest blessings upon you today and this week. Happy Resurrection Day. Father, we bless you. We worship you. We adore you today, God. You're worthy to be praised and worthy to be exalted. We come before you in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. We come interceding for one another right now, Father. We pray for the person who's saying we're holding. We ask you, God, to speak to them and bless them and heal them and deliver them, whatever they stand in the need of. Father, we pray in Jesus' name that you work a miracle in their life. As we come before you today, we not only pray for each other, but we pray for our brothers and sisters around the world. We pray for those who are participating with us in this worship experience online. We pray for the military around the world, God. We pray for families that have lost loved ones. We ask you, God, for your mercy and your compassion. As we come today, bless our service, bless our time together, bless the word of life. Allow it to cause somebody to be changed and transformed. Save somebody today. Deliver, heal, restore in the name of Jesus. Plant somebody this day, almighty God. We give you the glory and the thanks for what you've already done. We thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen, and amen. All right, you can be seated. I do want to take a moment and um, acknowledge um, the presence of a, a very special woman of God who uh, has really had an impact on our nation in ways that you don't know because she works behind the scenes. Some years ago, her husband, Tom Skinner, uh, really played a big role in the evangelical circles of our nation. And uh, she's, uh, he passed on and she now leads his or the organization that he started, Skinner Leadership Institute. And she's really ministering to uh, uh, y young adults, youth, and uh, politicians that really lead our country. And uh, she's worshiping with us this morning, and I want to give an acknowledgement to Dr. Barbara William Skinner that's here with us this morning. Can you hear her? I am, on the bo I am on the board that helps oversee this. I'm the chairman of the board, actually. She let me be the chairman of the board, and so I want to thank her for that. And I'm just honored to have her today. Okay, this morning, uh, this is Bible study. Look at your neighbor and say, we have a Bible study since you don't come. <laughs> for those who are regular attenders here, you know that that means we're going to be looking at a lot of verses and a lot of passages. So what I want to talk about today is misconceptions and lies. Say that, misconceptions and lies. I want to talk about it because what I've come to recognize as I witness and share the gospel with people every time I get an opportunity, and I try to do it on a daily basis, I realize that the stuff that people tell me as to why they don't love, serve God or go to church or uh, whatever, is always based on some misconception or some lie that they believe. They thought something, they heard something, they accepted it as truth, they believed it, and they've made decisions and practices in their life on the basis of these misconceptions and lies. How many of you know it's important what you believe because if you believe the wrong thing, it can jack your life up? So I thought I would spend this time today and talk about seven misconceptions, seven 
seven lies. As a matter of fact, if you go to John 14 very quickly, uh, I have two, I have two um, foundational scriptures for this message today, and they're, all, they're both in John. John 14, 6 uh, says, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's the first, that, that's an important thing. Jesus says he's the way, the truth, and the life. And the important point here is he said he's truth. You can trust him for truth. Some of you have built your lives around lies. You have, you're making practices based on lies and it's problematic. But he says he's the truth and we can trust him. We can have confidence in him because what he shares is truth. Now in John chapter 8, I want you to slide back to John chapter 8. And I know if you can't, if you don't have that, all of these verses I'm going to give you today are going to be up on the screen. You can read with us. And I want to read verse number 44. Jesus is talking in John 8, 44. And he says this to the, the Pharisees. He says, you are of your father, the devil. And the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources for he is a liar and the father of it. Woo! That's some strong words right there. When I was growing up, my mother didn't let me say the word liar. We had to say, you're a storyteller. We had to say, oh my, he's telling a story. But now that I'm an adult, I feel good to call people liars. You're lying. <laughs> and that's what Jesus says to them. He says, you, you are following the path of your head, your father. He says, you, you're not following God. You're in church, but you ain't following God. You're religious leaders, but you're not following God. You've got the facade of religiousness on you, but you, 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 you're not following God. He says, you are following and doing the things of your father, the devil. And he's a liar. He says, as a matter of fact, Jesus said, right, I'm right here in verse 44. He says, there's no truth in him. Y'all ever met somebody, they just can't tell the truth to save their life. Y'all ain't never met nobody like that? Maybe you that person that's just like that if you can't find nobody like that. He says, you have your father. He can't tell the truth because there's no truth in him. And what I want to spend some time talking about today is, is I, want to, I want to talk about some misconceptions and some lies that the devil has given and promoted and exalted that people have embraced and accepted and governed their life on the basis of it. And it's challenging and it's a problem because if you accept a lie and you believe it and you live your life on it, there can be dire consequences when you believe something that's not true. So I thought for a few moments today that you would bear with me. Let me walk through some, some lies and give you some scriptures for it. Here's the first lie that the devil tells. Here's the first thing. Here's the first misconception. Here it is. You don't have to go to church to worship God. Write that down. You don't got to go to church. And that's what a lot of people do. They don't go to church. They say, I don't have to go to church to worship God. Uh, so they, they worship at the Bedside Baptist Church. <laughs> Pillow Pentecostal Cathedral. <laughs> and they say, and I, I guess there is a level of truth to that, but it's not the complete truth. It, yes, yes, you don't have to go to church to worship, but you can worship anywhere. Matter of fact, it is the will of God that we live a lifestyle of worship. That we worship when we get up in the morning, when we roll out of our bed, that we worship throughout the course of the day. When you're on your job, you ought to be worshiping, your God, your, worshiping God. When your boss is in your grill, jumping all over you, and you want to give them a piece of your mind, you ought to be saying, thank you, Father, that I'm not telling them what I... You should be saying, God, I thank you, I have a job. Thank you, Lord. I'm not going to say nothing. I'm not going to cuss her back. I'm not going to give him a piece of my mind. I'm not going to quit because I like to eat. Thank you that I got a job. That's a worship moment. That's a worship moment. We ought to live a life of worship. But the concept that the devil wants you to think is that you don't need the church. You don't need to be connected to other believers. You don't need to go down to the church. That's what the devil wants you to think and believe. And yet a lot of people live their life that way. They've drawn a conclusion and they've embraced this lie that I don't have to go to church. But that is not what the Bible teaches. 
Matter of fact, go to Hebrews chapter 10. Let me give you this verse. I got seven of these things. I got to move fast. He's what Hebrews chapter 10 say. You say, somebody said, take your time. You know I can't take my time. That's why y'all tell me. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 10, and, and I think it's important for me to tell you about Hebrews chapter 10. This writer in Hebrews, we don't know his name, but he's writing to some Christians who have, some Jews have converted to Christianity, and they're thinking about quitting church, quitting Christianity. And he says this to them, and it's true to us, it's true for us too. In uh, Hebrews chapter 10, I want to read verse 24 and 25. Verse 24 says, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Not, verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. What? Whoa, that's powerful. Let me break it down to it. He says, he says we got to give, give consideration to other people. See, when you don't go to church and you stay home, you say you don't need a church, all you're thinking about is yourself. You're, you're being selfish. Look up and down your road. There's a selfish person. See if you can figure out who it is. Go ahead, look up and down. But the scripture says we ought to be considerate of one another in order to stir up love and good works. We should be considerate not just about what we desire or want, but we ought to be connected with the body of Christ and other people in the church so we can stir them up to do what it is God has called them to do. Now, I don't care why, why you say it. I ain't never felt stirred up sitting at Bedside Baptist. Y'all might as well tell the truth. Y'all have visited Bedside Baptist from time to time. You don't get stirred up until you get into relationship with people. God wants us to be relationally connected with other people. Matter of fact, verse 25 says, don't, don't forsake the assembling together as the manner of some is. Some people have made it a practice. They don't want to go to church. They don't think they need church. And so they don't. And that's a lie from the pit of hell. That's what the devil wants you to do. The devil wants you to stay disconnected from the church. The devil wants you to stay at home. The devil wants you to watch on television. The devil wants you to, to, to stay disconnected. But God designed the church and the fellowship of the body of Christ to help you become everything that God wants you to become. I don't know about y'all, but I need the church. I need the church. I need to be around other people. I need to be around people who encourage me. When I come to church and I see somebody who I know is going through drama and pain and I see them worshiping God, that inspires me to worship God through my pain and challenges. When I see God and I hear the testimonies and miracles of what God has done in somebody else's life, it encourages me that if God did it for them, he could do the same thing for me. As a matter of fact, the text says, and I love the scripture right here, it says you need to do that because you know that the day is approaching. What is that day? That's the day that Jesus is coming back, and he says you need to be surrounded about other people to help make sure you stay on the right course so that when Jesus comes back, you will be found in the right place doing the right thing. Now I feel some tension in the room. Somebody said there's tension in the room. You need the body of Christ, because there's tension, because I know you think you don't need the body of Christ, but you need the body of Christ. You need to be connected. Matter of fact, the Bible says that God loves unity. There's something spectacular when the people come together and get on one accord. God does the supernatural. People get healed. Shackles get broken. People get a new mindset and a new heart. People get delivered. People get breakthroughs. Marriages get healed. People come off drugs. People get saved. Their lives get transformed. When we come together and everybody's on one accord, God loves unity. And you can't be unified sitting at home by yourself. Go on and preach, Pastor. God calls you to be connected with the body of Christ and in the church and in his kingdom. As jacked up as the church is, God calls you to be a part of it because there's power in the church. And because the devil wants to keep you home, he's telling you, you don't have to go to church to worship God. I'm saying to you that the scripture clearly teaches the opposite. Don't make it a practice of not worshiping God collectively and unified with the church. Go on, Pastor. That's number one. Here's the second misconception and the lie that the devil tells. He says, I don't go, you don't go to church because the church is full of hypocrites. I ain't going down there with all them hypocrites down there. And you, you, you know what? It's true, the church does have hypocrites. It's full of hypocrites. Yes, there are hypocrites in the church. Look on your road, there's several hypocrites on your road. Look on you, I can guarantee you there's some hypocrites on your right and some hypocrites on your left. 
Matter of fact, I think if you check the seat you're sitting in, there might be a hypocrite in that seat too. Yes, the church has people who have problems and issues and challenges, but so do the, you got hypocrites on your job. There's hypocrites at the bank where you keep your money. You got hypocrites in the store you go to, on the fraternity that you're in, the sorority, the book club, the motorcycle club. Guess what? There's some hypocrites at the gym you work out at. Wait a minute. There's some hypocrites at the bar that you attend. Why you gonna let hypocrites stop you from going to church when you go to all these other things and you don't let the hypocrites stop you? There's a big difference between all those other places and this place. This is the best place for a hypocrite to be. This is, this is what's important. Here's what's important. Hypocrites can be changed when they come to church. Let me show you a passage right here. First, First Corinthians chapter 6. I love this passage right here. First Corinthians chapter 6. Let me read it starting at verse 9. Listen to this. Listen. Listen to this passage. It's up on the screen. You didn't bring your Bible. It's up on the screen. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers. Revilers mean party goers. I knew y'all would get quiet on that point right there. <laughs> nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. You somewhere in that list. But hold up, verse 11 says, and such were some of you. Oh, y'all missed a great spot. We all been in one of those categories. We all done some of that before. And I like verse 11, it says, and such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God, that's where we used to be. But when you come to church, something about the kingdom of God changes you. Woo! That's why I come to church and change me. Here's, let me just be honest with you. We all, we all jacked up. Everybody in here jacked up. I'm jacked up, you jacked up, the person next to you jacked up, people behind you jacked up, people to your left, right, in front of you. Everybody, everybody got something. Everybody got something. Yes. Nobody here perfect. Nobody here dots every eye. Nobody crosses every T. The church is not a social club for saints. It's a hospital for sick people. Yes. And I'm sick and you're sick and we're all sick and we come to see the doctor named Jesus. And even though I'm sick today, I'm not as sick today as I was last year. I'm getting better. Woo! This is the place for ministry and for healing and for deliverance and breakthroughs and answers. Get your marriage healed, get your children right. Get off your addictions and your drugs and your habits and your bad issues and your bad attitude to get a different change of mind and a different attitude. I don't know about y'all, I need the church. I need the people of God. I need the saints of the Most High God. I need the church. Somebody high five your neighbor and say, I need the church. No better place. Here's the deal. There's no better place for a hypocrite to be than in church. Matter of fact, I, I think I've told our church this before. I'm the chief sinner. I'm the, I'm the president of the Jacked Up Club. Matter of fact, we should call the name of our church Jacked Up Baptist Church. No, no. Jacked Up Joker Baptist Church. No, no, I don't call y'all jokers no more. Jacked Up Rascals Baptist Church. 
and I'm the lead jacked up joker. I don't dot every I, I don't cross every T. I never try to give an implication to anybody that I'm perfect. I've sinned and fallen short of, of God. You want to know what my sin is? None of your business what my sin is. Worry about your own. Get yourself straight. Let's all come together and let God do surgery on all of us one at a time. And what I discovered is that I'm better this year than I was the last year. Let me go to number three. I wish I had time. I could talk about that a little bit more. But don't let the fact that the church got hypocrites stop you. Oh, can I read another passage to y'all? Let me read just let me read 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. It's some of you know this by heart. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You get in Christ and old stuff starts dropping off. Yeah, nobody gets saved and become perfect, gets saved on Sunday and don't sin on Monday. It don't happen like that. It's a process. God starts cleaning us up and he starts working on us and he starts changing us. And as you get in Christ and get in his word and worship him and live for him, you, saw, you see stuff just starts dropping off. Things you used to do, you find yourself not doing them anymore. And places you used to go, you look up and say, I don't go down there no more. And people you used to hang out with, you say, you know what, I don't like to hang around them no more. God raises up some new friends for you. I wish I had somebody who knew what I was talking about. Here's number three. Here's another distraction, a misconception, a lie that stops people from getting connected with God and connecting with church. They say, all the church wants is my money. And so you get tired of the church asking for money. Now, I, I, I want you to know that the enemy wants you to think and believe that all the church wants is your money. Let me, let, me, let me explain something to you right quick. God does not need your money. Matter of fact, the cattle on a thousand hills belong to him. Which implies, here's what that verse means, when the Bible says that the cattle on a thousand hills belongs to him, what that means is God owns everything. Yeah, he doesn't need he doesn't want your money. He don't need your money. He doesn't want your money. What he wants is your heart. If he gets a hold of your heart, if you make a commitment with giving him your heart, that's what he's after, is your heart. And as a matter of fact, what I've discovered is you might go to some churches that put a focus on money, but let me talk about the First Baptist Church of Leonard. We don't put focus on money here. Matter of fact, what we focus on is teaching you how to manage your money. And you know what we've discovered? When you manage your money God's way, I just finished a series on financial freedom just past few weeks, and the testimonies are incredible. When you manage your money the way God wants you to manage your money, he blesses you in supernatural ways. And a part of what he wants you to do is to manage your money so that you have a heart to want to be a giver. Yeah, the church teaches people how to be givers because we live in a, a selfish culture. So we're trying to teach people how to be givers. And, and, and when you give, here's what happens. Luke 6, 38. Jot this verse down. Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Jot this verse down. Here's what it says. It says, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. Oh, I like that. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. We teach people how to manage their money. And a part of managing your money is learning how to be a giver. And when you give, God will give it back to you, pressed down, shaken together, and he'll give you more, 30, 60, 100 times more than you gave. Yes. As a matter of fact, I tell people all the time, don't tell me that you have had an encounter with the eternal God of the universe and that he gets in your head and you think differently. And he gets in your eyes and you look at life differently. And he gets in your tongue and you start talking differently. And he gets in your heart and you love differently. And you get your, he gets in your hands and you worship. And he gets in your feet and you dance. But somehow or another, after he done got into all of that, he slipped around your wallet. It is impossible to have an encounter with God and you not want a soul to help that same thing happen to other people. 
You can't meet Jesus and be so selfish that you don't want somebody else to meet Jesus. But that's what the devil wants you to think. That all the church wants is your money. Let the record reflect God don't want your money. He wants your heart. Here's number four. I'm trying to be out of here on time. Here's number four. People stop going to church. People have lied, taken the misconception. They don't want to walk with God because church people have hurt me. I went down there to the church people and they hurt me. They did me wrong. Uh, somebody gonna sing another somebody done me wrong song and they're gonna put it on the church and here's what I would tell you listen carefully and, so, and jot down this verse Psalm 62 verse 5 jot it down because when people come to church and they get hurt by people they get hurt because they had an expectation of church people so you came to church expecting people to treat you differently than in the world but I need, to, I need to set the record straight. Church people are in the world people too. I should have got a few more amens on that point than that. What am I trying to tell you? Here's what, here's what Psalm 62 and 5 says. It says that we should put our expectations in God and not in people. People will let you down every time. I can't get no help up in here. People will disappoint you every time. Psalm 62 and 5 says, My soul waits silently for God alone. For my expectation is from Him. And what I'm telling you is, don't put your expectation in people because people will let you down every time. Don't be shocked because somebody in church did mess you up. The church is full of jacked up people. I told you, this is the jacked up Joker Baptist church. Any church you go to, the people in there are messed up. Don't put your expectation in people. I'm telling don't put your expectation in me. Don't put it in the deacons. Don't put it in anybody. Give your expectation to God. He will never let you down. Oh, this is a significant point. Because it seems like every other person that I stop, stop and talk to, the minister to, they can go to some story where somebody did them wrong from church. What else do you expect from human beings? Human beings are going to mess up every time. And so the, the passage and the challenge and the encouragement is that you, you never put your hope in people. And by the way, while I'm on this point, while I'm on this point, I want to, I want to say something about this. While I'm on this point, never allow what somebody else does to stop you from worshiping the Almighty God. Don't ever let somebody make you stop going to church. Make you stop serving God. Make you quit the choir. Quit the, Ur the Usher board. Come on, somebody say the Usher board. Don't, don't ever let anybody. And if you, listen, if you allow them to do this, if you let them convince you to walk away, the devil has won. I want to read uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2 to you. And I'm going to read verses 7 through 11. Can I do that to you? Now, this is a passage where the Apostle Paul is talking to the church in Corinth because they had some people in the church doing some bad things. So he says to them, so that, verse 7, 2 Corinthians 7, uh, chapter 2, verse 7, so that on the contrary, you ought rather to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. He, he said, what you ought to do instead of being bitter and, 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 and treating the person who did you wrong, wrong, he said, you should rather forgive. Therefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. He said, somebody do you wrong, just love the hell out of them. Come on, talk to me for just a second. Verse nine, for to this end, I also wrote that I might put you to the test, whether you are obedient in all things. He said, if you're a child of God and you have a relationship with him, somebody hurts you, you forgive them. And he says, I wrote this to put you to the test that you might to see whether or not you would be obedient in all things. Now, whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ. He says, if you forgive, I'm going to forgive too. But I like what verse 11 says, because if you don't forgive, here's verse 11. Lest Satan should take advantage of us. 
for we are not ignorant of his devices. The devil's plan is to get you bitter against somebody and when you get bitter against somebody, don't want to talk to them, not taking their calls, don't want to be reconciled and won't forgive them, you open up the door for the enemy to have control and influence in your life. Some of you are where you are because you have bitterness in your heart and you won't forgive and when you don't forgive, you open up the door for the devil to reap heaven and hell in your life. Go on and preach, Pastor. And so the, the acknowledgement, the, the admonishment, the encouragement today to you today is to forgive and don't allow the people who hurt you and mess you up to send you away. Let me go to number five. Some of you have what I call God pain. God pain means you're not mad with people, you're mad with God. Because God didn't do something that you wanted God to do. You had God pain. You have a, a bitterness against God because you had something happen in your life that you don't know why it happened. You got some pain, some situation, some death, some divorce, some lost job, some, some, something that happened in your life that has brought pain to you and in the back of your mind, you're angry with God. And my assignment today is I have to tell you, I cannot tell you, I cannot answer for you why God allowed something dramatic to happen in your life that's caused you to have pain. I can't give you the answer and I don't want to perpetrate and act like I can tell you why because I don't know why. But here's what I do know. Here's what I have learned. Here's what I put my confidence in is the verse Romans 8, 28. And here's what that verse says. All things work together for good. Y'all excuse me for just a second. Somehow or another, I learned by coming to church, Romans 8, 28, that all things, somebody say all, all. means all. All means all. Say that. All means all. Y'all didn't get it. Let me give it to you again. All means everything. Somebody say everything. It means that everything that happens in my life, if God permitted it to come into the doorway of my circumstance, he, might not have been, he may not have been the author of it, but for it to enter into my life, he had to sign off on it. And if he signed off on it, he knows that when it's all said and done, somehow I'm going to benefit from what happened in it. Woo! I wish I had somebody who understood what I was trying to tell you. All things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. I look back over my life and all of the things that happened that brought me pain and caused me to cry and made the devil try to make me bitter. But now that I am where I am in my walk with God, I can look back and thank him for everything that happened that once brought me pain. Oh, this is an important point because the devil has tripped some of you up with this piece and he's made you angry and bitter. And my assignment is to tell you that all things are working together. It may not be apparent at the moment. <laughs> you may not be able to see it right today, but God is orchestrating and moving the events of your life and he's shifting things and taking things out and putting things in so that when he gets to you where he wants you to ultimately be, everything will be in order and you will be ready for it. I realize when I look back over my life and some pains and some challenges I had that God allowed me to go through those things so that when I became the pastor of the First Baptist Church of Glen Arden, I would be better able to minister to hurting and bruised people that if I had not have had it, I wouldn't be able to do it. Somebody say amen, give the Lord a shout. Oh man, I gotta hurry up, hold up. Matter of fact, some of you think God doesn't care about your life. So you say, why would he let this happen? If he loved me, he wouldn't have let this happen. Here's what Jeremiah 29 and 11 says. Y'all ain't got to say nothing. He says, I know the thoughts that I have towards you, says the Lord. They are thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future 
and a hope. Y'all excuse me. God's got a future for you and hope for you. He hasn't forgot about you. He ain't trying to hurt you. He's trying to give you a future and hope and give you peace. Somebody ought to say hallelujah. Amen. What number was that? Here's number six. Here's some, some people think if, if your good outweigh your bad, you'll make it to heaven. That would be a negative. If your good outweigh your bad, that's not true. We are not saved by human efforts. Your works, your service, your giving will not earn you a spot in heaven. There are a lot of people who think that if my good outweighs my bad, if, I, if I'm a nice, good person, that God will surely let me in. That is the opposite of what the Bible teaches. Matter of fact, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, let me read it to you. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 says, for, for by grace you have been saved through faith. By grace, grace is God's, God's unmerited favor. God extends his favor to you, for by grace you have been saved through faith. You get saved by grace through the instrument of your faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then it says this, and not that of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Here's what that say. You can't get to heaven by your works. Hell will be full of a lot of people who think that they're going to go to heaven because they are good people. Look at your neighbor and say, you ain't all that good. As a matter of fact, you, your measurement of good is based on you comparing yourself to somebody else. Don't compare yourself to other people. Compare yourself to the God of the universe. And when you compare yourself to God, all of our righteousness is as a filthy rag. We're all dirty. We're all messed up when we compare ourselves to God. But here's what he says. You jacked up, you tore up, you messed up. But he says, I got a gift I'm going to give to you. And I'm going to give it to you when you put your faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's 9 o'clock. I got one more point. I wish I had time to talk about that works thing. A lot of people have been tripped up by that works thing. You're you going to trick yourself, you're going to fool yourself thinking you're going to get to heaven by works. Here's number seven and I'll be finished. I'll, I'll be done. Here's number seven. And number seven is this, is that people think that Jesus is not God. He's just a good man. Or he's just a prophet. But he's not all he said he was. Well, let me tell you what the Bible says. The Bible gives us a definition of who Jesus is. And here's what it says in John 1.1. 1, 1. Because I know some people say he wasn't God. He's not the Savior. He's not, he's not all he said he is. But in John 1.1, 1, 1, here's what the Bible says. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Y'all, excuse me, y'all missed that. The Word was God. Who's the Word? Slide down to verse 14, John 1.14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory has of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth what you talking about pastor here's what the Bible's telling us Jesus is God wrapped up in human form and the reason I put my confidence in him and my trust in him and the reason I believe and put my trust in him for my salvation is he did what no other so-called religion leader has done Muhammad didn't die for my sins Buddha didn't die for my sins Confucius didn't die for my sins Father Divine didn't die for my sin Sun Young Moon didn't die for my sin Jesus Christ died for my sins He hung on the cross and God whipped him and gave him the whipping that you and I should have gotten for our sins, but he took our place. Jesus took my place. Jesus took your place and died and he got buried. And the thing that's significant about his burial is that when he buried, he carried all of our sins away. Oh, y'all better remember that. 
In other words, he buried it never to be reminded. Anybody ever reminded you of something that you did wrong? Jesus said, I'm going to take all your sin and I'm going to bury it and I'm never going to remind you about it ever again. But hold up. He didn't stop right there. He didn't just die. He didn't just get buried. But we're celebrating that one day he got up out of the grave with all power. Muhammad didn't get out of the grave. Buddha didn't get up out of the grave. Confucian is still in the grave. But Jesus is alive and well. Hallelujah. Now let me close. You say, well, Pastor, how you know you weren't there? No, but I did go over to Israel. I did go to the place where they told me where they buried him. Because I had to check for myself. And I looked in there and he wasn't there. But I know some of the skeptics will push that off. But here's what the skeptics cannot push off. You can say whatever you want about it. You can say somebody stole his body out of the grave if you want. You can say they took me to the wrong grave if you want. But one thing you cannot take away is he got up in my heart. <laughs> he got up in my life. He made himself real to me and gave me life and gave me joy and gave me peace and freed me from my challenges in life. And my assignment is to tell you he'll do the same thing for you in your life today. All you need to do is acknowledge that you need him and humble yourself. Matter of fact, get, if you know you need him, get out of your seat and make your way down here immediately right now. Come quickly. I'm way over time. I didn't mean to take so much time. But make your way and come right now and say, I need the Lord right now and say yes to him. Don't be ashamed. Don't be embarrassed. But make your way right now. God is waiting with his arms stretched out wide for you to come. Come. That's right, encourage them, y'all. They're coming. Amen. I'm proud of you, stuff like that. So proud of you. How you doing, man?